Like, share, and subscribe here on Oncology Tube to get notifications when similar videos are available. Thank you, Dr. Zell and uh, MOASC organizers for inviting me to give this uh, talk. So I'm going to um, talk about uh, updates of breast cancer and in particular ASCO 2023. Uh, here are my disclosures. So I have divided my talk to a hormone positive and HER2 positive, uh, and I selected three abstracts. Um, so uh, the first one will be um, early stage hormone positive breast cancer, Natalie's study, and in metastatic setting, Sonia, and also HER2 positive breast cancer will be fair gain. So uh, first uh, study, first abstract was presented by Dr. Slayman in ASCO, and that is ribocyclib and endocrine therapy as adjuvant treatment for hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients. This was the results of phase three study, Natalie. So we know that uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer is very common, and uh, we uh, stage one to three patients, we usually uh, give our patients uh, adjuvant endocrine therapy, uh, but we know that uh, the recurrence rate is also high, especially late recurrence happens a lot in this patient's population. So uh, this study actually looked at CDK46 uh, inhibitors and adding them to adjuvant setting to look at the outcome uh, to reduce the risk of recurrence. So uh, we know that uh, there, uh, the data for ribocyclib is uh, pretty, it was pretty robust uh, for me in metastatic setting. Uh, and uh, we know that in uh, Mona Lisa 2, Mona Lisa 3, and Mona Lisa 7 studies, they all showed improvement not only in DFS, but uh, also in overall survival of uh, metastatic patients who took uh, ribocyclib. So uh, Natalie's study actually looked at uh, breast cancer patients, hormone positive, stage one, two, three, uh, that uh, they were actually, they had high risk features. So uh, they allowed even uh, node negative patients to enroll as long as they had high care 67 or they had grade three uh, breast cancer. So they were randomized one to one to receive ribocyclic plus non-steroidal AI versus AI alone. And uh, their uh, primary endpoint was invasive disease-free survival. And they used actually ribocyclic 400 milligram and that the duration of treatment was three years. So there were very unique features about uh, this uh, study. First of all, their inclusion criteria was pretty broad. Uh, they allowed uh, patients uh, who were uh, even, you know, stage 2A, 2B, 3, all to enroll, even patients who were not negative. And also, they reduced the dose of ribocyclib so patients would experience less toxicities at the same time, but they increased the duration of treatment to three years compared to abemocyclib that we use, and this duration is two years. So uh, the uh, eligible, when you look at the eligibility criteria, criteria, you see that um, except a stage one patients, everyone was eligible to enroll in this study. Um, so the baseline characteristics was a pretty much very good balance um, between two uh, different arms. Uh, a lot of patients actually were N1, the majority of them, they were N1, so one to three positive lymph nodes, but they also had about 27 to 29 percent, they were N0. And uh, the results showed improvement in invasive disease-free survival at uh, with three years of follow-up. The absolute benefit was 3.3%, but the relative uh, benefit was actually about 25.2%. Uh, uh, so it has that ratio of uh, 0.748. Uh, and when we look at all the subgroups of patients, they all benefited from this um, uh, drug. Uh, no matter if uh, they uh, were node negative, node positive, positive, every, um, all subgroups, they benefited. And uh, there was also improvement in distance disease-free survival, which has a ratio of 0 0.739, so about 24, 5, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> yeah, 26 percent relative risk reduction. And also there was a trend in improvement in overall survival. 
And uh, then they compared uh, the toxicity with the historical data that they had uh, with Mona Lisa studies that they were using uh, metastatic setting and they used 600 milligram and they saw much less toxicities, especially with QT prolongation that is uh, kind of uh, one of the uh, important side effects of the drug and also with neutropenia. So patients, as expected, they also had uh, less toxicities. But at the bottom, uh, we can see uh, the comparison of toxicities with the control arm that they received only AI, and of course, the toxicities were higher in patients who received ribocyclic. But there was nothing unusual from the side effects. So the conclusion of the investigators was that actually the study met its primary endpoint and uh, it can uh, add uh, definitely a treatment option to our earlier stage hormone positive um, breast cancer patients to reduce the risk of uh, recurrence in future. I just want to compare this study with uh, Monarch E study. Uh, we all know that a few years ago, abemocyclib was approved by FDA based on the results of this study, uh, also in adjuvant setting for uh, earlier stage breast cancer patients who are uh, high risk to have a recurrence. But in this study, you know, uh, patients they were heavily node positive, or if they had one, two, three positive lymph nodes, then uh, they needed to have other high risk features. So no, uh, no node negative patient was allowed. And the patients received full dose, but duration of treatment was only for two years. And uh, this study also showed great results with uh, reducing the risk of recurrence and invasive disease-free survival and also distant recurrence-free survival about uh, reducing it by about 34%. And so when uh, now it seems that we have two studies, both fantastic results, and it just uh, we need to wait for the long-term, basically, follow-up of those studies because we know that breast cancer, unfortunately, hormone-positive breast cancer, we see a lot of late recurrence. So that's why that uh, long-term follow-up will be very important. And also, when uh, we look at the uh, kind of uh, the eligibility criteria for these two studies, um, the definitely Definitely, Natalie's study had broader inclusion criteria, but uh, N1 and micromet was not allowed. But if they had high risk features, the, the micrometastasis was allowed in uh, Monarch E study. So it all comes basically to the insurance coverage, selection of patients, side effects, and uh, other factors, uh, which agent to choose. And we should also remember that in adjuvant setting, uh, olaparib is also a great option in our BRCA positive patients. And it was approved also, it is approved by FDA uh, based on Olympia study that 18% of patients in that study were hormone receptor positive. A lot of times we just focus on olaparib, triple negative, but no, actually 18% of patients were hormone positive and it can be also used in uh, adjuvant setting in BRCA patients only. Okay, so the second abstract, sorry, questions are for the end, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so, um, the, and it's actually one year, but you know, <laughs> I know what you meant, but. Okay, so uh, now the Sonia study uh, is the second abstract, so that was the primary outcome of this uh, phase three study. So uh, the Sonia study is a Dutch study that uh, was a randomized phase three study comparing CDK46 inhibitors as first line versus no CDK46 inhibitor as first line. So when we look at the uh, actually a study design, Patients who had metastatic breast cancer, hormone positive, they should not have been in any uh, visceral crisis, so they were randomized one to one to receive uh, AI plus CDK46 versus AI alone. And uh, their rationale was that they wanted, they wanted to see that if we need to use CDK46 inhibitors as first line, or if we can wait and use these uh, drugs as second line. And then when patients, they had disease progression, 
then they switch to Fazlodex. Uh, and those patients who did not receive CDK4-6 as first line, CDK4-6 was added to Fazlodex in second line. So the primary endpoint was PFS2, which means PFS at the end of second line. They also looked at other um, things like you know, quality of life, overall survival, as, and also cost effectiveness as their secondary endpoint. So uh, the baseline characteristics was pretty balanced. The only thing that we need to pay attention is that uh, the majority of patients were postmenopausal, and the CDK4-6 that they used was actually palbocyclib or Ibrans. 91% of patients received Ibrans, and I will explain about that later. And uh, so uh, otherwise, and also a lot of patients had a disease-free interval more than two years. Uh, and obviously, the duration of receiving CDK4-6 inhibitor for patients who received it uh, for first line was much higher. It was about 25 months versus second line was shorter, which is what we expect. So uh, the PFS as first line, definitely CDK4-6 as first line, we know, and this is uh, basically um, compatible with the previous studies that they were done. So patients, the, they had uh, PFS was much longer in patients who had CDK4-6 inhibitor. Uh, but when they looked at second line CDK4-6 inhibitor, there was not much difference between PFS uh, if it was used as first or second line. So PFS2 was actually uh, not statistically uh, different. The difference was not statistically significant. And the overall survival also was the same with a hazard ratio of 0.98. And they could not find any subgroup of patients that they actually benefited from CDK46 first line or CDK46 second line. So here is the just a summary. So the PFS was basically uh, the same. So as we can see, the, uh, the PFS, no difference, PFS2, OS, no difference. But when you look at the safety summary, patients who receive it as first line, they need to be on it for 25 months. And second line is only about eight months. So that's why that patients are exposed for longer period of time to all the side effects of uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors. So that's why that uh, their um, conclusion was that we are not improving anything with using CDK4-6 as first line therapy. We are not improving PFS, OS, quality of life. We're just increasing the duration of exposure and increasing the side effects of this drug. So they are challenging the need for using CDK4-6 as first line therapy. And now I'm just going to review this study. So as first line, we know that uh, we have uh, strong data from, you know, Peloma 2, Mona Lisa 2, Monarch 3 study, uh, three compounds, abemocyclib, ribocyclib, and palbocyclib, they all improve PFS. But when it comes to overall survival, we don't have any data suggesting that palbocyclib actually improves uh, OS. And we know that in this study, 91% of patients, they received palbocyclib. And the other thing is that a second line also is the same. All these studies, Mona Lisa 3, Monarch 2, Peloma 3, were done as second line in combination with Fazlodex, uh, all these three compounds. And the Peloma 3, which was for uh, Ibrans or Palbocyclib, there was no improvement in overall survival. It was only PFS. And uh, uh, the investigators for that study, for uh, Peloma 3 study later, you know, they said that uh, in uh, basically a subgroup analysis that was unplanned, uh, they uh, mentioned that actually uh, there is overall survival benefit in patients who did not have chemo in that subgroup of patients. But overall, we don't have any strong 
uh, data or evidence suggesting that it improves overall survival. So that's why that uh, there were a few issues with this study. First of all, actually, overall, we know we all have had patients that they did great with just first line AI. And sometimes our patients, they refuse to have CDK4-6 inhibitors, or uh, they just have a lot of comorbidities, and we just uh, want to give them AI. So we all have had patients with great response. But um, definitely, it would be great if we had some biomarkers and uh, in a way that we could predict who will have long period of response to AI alone. Uh, but at the same time, we know that um, palbocyclib, there is not any evidence regarding palbocyclib really improving overall survival. And also, we rarely use FASODEC single agent as second line. And this is, uh, the reason is that we have a lot of next generation sequencing that we do for our patients. And uh, we find a mutation or something, we combine, you know, uh, another agent with Fazodex. We rarely use Fazodex alone. And uh, in this study, we use Fazodex alone. But definitely, we know that patients' uh, side effects will be less. Uh, and the quality of life also was no difference when, uh, there was no difference when they uh, checked uh, with fact B score. So here is an overview of what we do with our hormone positive uh, metastatic patients. So usually we start with AI plus, uh, plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor, unless the guideline will change. I, I'm not sure if it will change. And then uh, we do also consider doing next generation sequencing after disease progression, and we add other agents. For example, we add alpelisib if there is any PIK3CA mutation, uh, we can add LSS-strand if there is ESR1 mutation. So, and the, there is always, if for her to low expression, there is also TDXD that we can use. Uh, so that's usually the pattern uh, that we practice uh, for our metastatic hormone positive. So the third, the last, but not the least, uh, abstract in ASCO that I thought is important was fair gain study. And uh, this is actually a three-year invasive disease-free survival report of a phase two study for de-escalation treatment for our HER2 positive patients in early stage breast cancer. Uh, we all know that uh, patients who are HER2 positive, they're doing fantastic due to all the good drugs that we have, HER2 directed therapy. And we are looking for ways to actually um, basically de-escalate treatment in this patient population and to give them less chemo and just give them HER2 directed therapy. And we also know that PET scan can actually predict response to treatment and uh, predict PCR, which is very important to us in neoadjuvant setting, neoadjuvant treatment of our uh, breast cancer patients. So the Fergin study, uh, just, you know, uh, they were trying in this study uh, to use that opportunity to actually chemo the escalation with use of PET scan to predict who will have PCR so we can avoid giving them chemotherapy. So uh, this here is a study design, patients stage one to three uh, breast cancer were enrolled in this uh, study and they, heard to, uh, they were HER2 positive by IHC or by FISH. And they should have had a lesion that was actually uh, detectable uh, with a PET scan. So they had PET scan in uh, at baseline. And then group A, they had TCHP. This is the control arm. TCHP for two cycles, then PET scan. And after that, TCHP for another four cycles. And then uh, followed by surgery and then HP. And we also had um, control arms. So uh, they, the control arm on patients, they started with HP, Herceptin pertuzumab only, then they had PET scan. If they showed response, then they received six more cycles of HP. And if they did not show response, then they were switched to TCHP, so combination of chemo and HP. And then after surgery, those patients who did not show, did not have PCR, they received adjuvant TCHP. Uh, 
So uh, they, and otherwise everyone else, they got HP. So the primary endpoint was PCR that actually was reported previously, and they reported three-year invasive disease-free survival in group B in ASCO. So when you look at the PCR, actually PCR was pretty good in group B in patients who were responders. So they only received HP. The PCR rate was about 38%, which is fantastic. So these patients never had any chemo and they had PCR. And when we look at invasive disease-free survival in group B, and this includes the entire group B, even those patients who did not respond and then they received their chemo in adjuvant setting. It was uh, excellent. It was 95.4%. And when they looked at a subgroup of patients who had actually PCR, so group B PCR, which means they never had any chemo, uh, the three-year invasive disease-free survival was almost 99%. And of course, when we look at the safety data, patients who did not have any chemo, they did fantastic. The side effects were very limited. Um, compared to patients who received chemo. So the conclusion, first of all, the study met its primary endpoint, and the conclusion is that uh, this we should consider doing PET scan and predict basically response and PCR with using PET scan to avoid giving our patients unnecessary chemotherapy in neoadjuvant settings since we have so many good HER2 directed therapies. And I just wanted to mention a study that was um, presented by Dr. Harbeck a couple years ago in ASCO, and she also showed that they were, uh, her study was different, but uh, the escalation was really um, uh, works really well because 25 to 35 percent of patients that she randomized to HP only compared to HP plus Taxol, they actually, they also had PCR. So it's very important to be, if we can select that subgroup of patients and avoid giving them chemo, that would be really good. So overall take-home points is that uh, from all the presentations today, so Natalie's study showed improvement in IDFS, DDFS, and OS with three years of adjuvant ribocyclib, lower dose 400 milligram, in combination with non-steroid AI in a stage two and three hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Sonia's study showed similar outcome with AI alone in first-line treatment of hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer compared to AI plus CDK46 inhibitor. And PET scan can predict PCR to HP, herceptin pertuzumab, without chemotherapy in neoadjuvant treatment of HER2 positive breast cancer. And in this way, we can de-escalate neoadjuvant therapy, de-escalate chemo in one third of our HER2 positive breast cancer patients. Like, share, and subscribe here on Oncology Tube to get notifications when similar videos are available.